CompTIA Security Plus practice questions for the SY0501. Uh, this is the new exam for the Security Plus. So let's talk about those right now. So of course, if you're looking for any sort of CompTIA Security Plus training, feel free to give me a call. Even if you're in Hawaii, I just got back from there not too long ago teaching another class, uh, but happy to come back out. Uh, whether it's the Big Island, Honolulu, whatever, again, feel free to shoot, reach out to me. I'm happy to come out to, even if you're not in Hawaii, we'll come out and make sure that you guys are up to speed on all this kind of stuff. So before we get started on the practice questions, a little bit about the format that we're going to use here. So essentially, I'm going to give you roughly about 10 seconds to answer each of these questions, kind of in your mind, write them down on a piece of paper if you'd like to. But if you need a little bit more time than 10 seconds, whether it's that you know, people different people read at different paces or whatever, uh, feel free to pause the video. And of course, once you've figured out the answer that you want, go ahead and hit play. And you can actually see my explanation of the different questions. Uh, so hopefully this will help you succeed in passing your exam. And again, if you'd like any training, feel free to reach out to me. And if you like the video while you're watching, I hope you'll consider clicking on that subscribe button down below or like. And if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to leave those down in the comments section down below as well. But let's go ahead and get started with question number one here. So Joe believes that his organization has been the subject of a pool attack. This MITM, or man in the middle exploit, specifically targets which of the following? Well, we know that the Poodle attack is actually against TLS in CBC mode. CBC is cipher block chaining. Uh, the ECB is the electronic code book. And essentially what this does is it actually gets the attack to uh, downgrade to an SSL connection. So of course, SSL being more vulnerable, which is not a good thing. Of course, there's plenty of information on Wikipedia and Google. Uh, I may put up a video myself about those here soon. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll go ahead and move on to question number two. Three companies have decided to partner together and so employees will be regularly working at multiple locations. In order to allow these employees to authenticate when on their partner's wireless networks what technology should be implemented, well, we know that this is Radius Federation. So of course with Radius we're basically validating usernames and passwords against some sort of a authentication service like AAA. Uh, with Federation it's basically the idea that we can actually authenticate against multiple different places. Uh, it's basically what we know is kind of federated identity, federated identity management. Uh, so Radius Federation, of course, takes that to another step where we can essentially uh, validate from multiple locations against basically kind of a centralized provider. Which of the following situations is most vulnerable to a script kitty performing an attack against an organization? So of course, this is going to be an unpatched internet, web, and email servers. We know that there's all sorts of tools that script kitties can use to attack these different types of things. Uh, things like a proximity badge, of course, isn't really going to be using a script against it. Passwords on a sticky note, again, there's really no scripts or applications to attack that. We've also got encrypted backup media, again, assuming that it's offline, really nothing that a script kitty is going to do. But unpatched internet connected uh, web and email servers, definitely going to be a good target for someone that's really kind of a, a newbie, we might like to say, or a noob uh, to the hacking or IT security world. So uh, this is going to be D, unpatched internet connected web and email servers. So let's go ahead and move on to question number four. The Anne wants to use cryptography to protect passwords for a new web-based tool that is being developed. She chooses an algorithm that uses a fixed length output that is not reversible. Which algorithm might she have chosen? Well, we know that SHA-256 is a hashing algorithm that's commonly used to protect passwords. Uh, so this is going to be SHA-256 or letter A for our answers here. So Gene is worried that if an attacker had rainbow tables available, that they might be able to crack some of the passwords that have been hashed and stored on a server. Which of the following might render these rainbow tables useless? 
So we know that rainbow tables are essentially kind of like a spreadsheet of one column contains all these hashes, another con column contains all the clear text. So essentially if we go through and render the, the passwords using some sort of extra characters, extra information, in addition to the password, when it all runs through the uh, hashing algorithm together, kind of combined, then essentially it kind of renders that rainbow table useless. Uh, of course, a retina scanner, MD5, full disk encryption, none of those are really going to help us here, but salting of the passwords before we run it through the hashing algorithm certainly would. What command can be used on a Linux server to schedule jobs or tasks to run at regular intervals or at specific times? Of course, this is going to be a cron tab. You know, Windows has its own task scheduler, and in Linux and Unix, we call this cron jobs or the cron tab. Uh, so this is going to be C. Uh, now, the other commands you definitely do want to know for the Security Plus exam as well. That's not to say that these are not useful commands, uh, but this particular question is just specifically related to the cron tab command. Tori wants to determine last year's comprehensive monetary losses from hard drive failures within her department. What two pieces of information will she need to calculate this amount? So of course, if we are looking for the annual loss expectancy, basically the entire monetary losses for an entire year, then we need two pieces of information here. We need our single loss expectancy, how much does each occurrence actually cost us, as well as our ARO, the annual rate of occurrence. How often does this actually happen? So of course, when we take the average amount per occurrence, multiply it times the number of times that it happens per year, this is going to be our annual loss expectancy or ALE. Again, you do want to make sure that you know your acronyms for this exam because just like you see here, some of the questions may only have acronyms for the answers or it may reference them in the question itself. And so learning the acronyms will of course help. And I'll try and put a resource down below where you can actually study those acronyms as well. So go ahead and click on that link as well to check those out once you're done watching this video. Bob's company is investigating why his organization's internet connection appears to be running very slow all of a sudden. Upon analyzing the logs, he, he notices a large number of ICMP echo replies on an inbound interface from a number of different IP addresses. What type of attack is most likely occurring? So we know a DOS is a denial of service. Bluejacking, of course, is a Bluetooth attack. Cross-site scripting also isn't going to cause large number of ICMP echo replies, but a distributed denial of service or a DDoS attack is going to be something where we could potentially see a large number of ICMP echo replies coming into our network. Alice is implementing and configuring authentication settings on her company's Cisco routers. Which of the following technologies should she, would she probably choose to do this? So we know that TACAX Plus is a Cisco proprietary protocol that we use for authentication. Uh, so if you've talked, been through one of my classes or if you've read up on some of the different authentication methods and protocols, you should be familiar with TACAX Plus. It should have identified that we're using this for Cisco devices and be able to narrow it down pretty quickly to TACAX Plus. Mrs. Fields wants to digitally sign an email that she is sending to her Aunt Jemima. Which of the following will she need to perform this action? So of course, in order to digitally sign different documents or emails, essentially what happens is that we actually take a hash of the message and then we basically encrypt that hash using our private key. And then whenever we send that message to someone, we include that signature and anyone can basically decrypt that hash using our public key. Remember, we can always share our public keys we never share our private keys. So in order for them to basically verify, they do have to have a copy of that public key as well. So again, I hope you've enjoyed these practice questions. I'll be sure to put up some more, hopefully in the very near future. In the meantime, feel free to check out the links below and I will hopefully see you guys very soon. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you tuning in. And don't forget to click on that subscribe button down below for me as well.